Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I am your host Jake O'Neill. Today we are going to be looking at bloggers, YouTube and brands who is responsible. Uh, as ever on our webinars you can join in the conversation online. Uh, use the hashtag video. Uh, you can add us on Twitter, talk to us on Facebook, uh, email us if you've got any questions or if you want to make your own blog we'd appreciate those as well. Uh, I am joined today by Lucy Wood, who is a freelance writer and YouTuber of all things. Good morning, Lucy. Good morning. Hope you're all well. So today we're going to be talking, uh, to start with, about this man, who hopefully needs very little introduction, though I'm sure he'd probably like that. Um, and Lucy is going to talk us through why Logan Paul is now at the front and centre uh, of our collective conscience, for better or worse. Um, so Logan Paul is an American vlogger. I think at the moment he's got about 17 million subscribers, which is just an insane number really. Um, no one, he wasn't really someone that a lot of people were talking about to begin with um, until he posted a video which caught everybody's attention for all the wrong reasons. Um, he, during a trip to Japan, he visited the notorious suicide forest. Um, he vlogged his experience there while wearing a fluffy alien hat just to make things particularly poignant. Um, and during his vlog, he also documented his discovery of a dead body in the forest. Um, and the way he addressed the discovery was very just completely inappropriate, shocking for everybody to, to see, um, and it was something that caused a huge backlash online. Um, and then his reaction following that backlash was also something that was really heavily debated in the media. Yeah, so that's this, uh, this apology here um, on the uh, aptly named video, So Sorry, uh, and also his, his tweeted out uh, written apology. Uh, and I feel like the biggest issue with this is that um, people thought that he was perhaps being disingenuous and maybe that was followed through with his comeback. Yeah, definitely. So I think the way that he presented the apology video was, in his eyes, I think he'd made it visibly as genuine as he possibly could. It was very sort of like low lighting, focused on him. There was tears in his eyes. He looked as though he'd been crying, up all night crying. Um, but that just made the whole thing seem... As, as fake as it possibly could, I think. Um, the way he addressed it was very self-centered. It was all about him and his own actions um, and how he had learned so much from the experience and how he should be forgiven because we all make mistakes. And I think in the written apology as well, he spoke a lot about um, the, his own influence and his own power online. And it was almost a bragging apology, really, more than anything that was actually genuine. And then he took, what, like a two-week break and came back with some new videos um, and surprise, surprise. Yeah, so I think he took maybe two or three weeks offline, um, which was a lovely experience for everybody else, but then came back with the most bizarre video of all time. I think he was supposed to be some kind of like, it was like the dawn of man. He was like some kind of caveman or something, and it was all supposed to be like super funny, but I think he'd forgotten about the fact that actually none of this was very funny in the slightest. <laughs> um, so it definitely, definitely missed the mark there. And then YouTube's, YouTube's reaction, um, to all of this was, was at first slow, but eventually they have done something. Yeah, so I think it took over a week for YouTube to issue any kind of reaction, which was kind of bizarre, to be honest, because the video was top of the YouTube trending page um, for a good 24 hours, I think. Um, so the original reaction was that it took 24 hours to have the video actually removed from the number one spot on the trending page after it had gained, I think, nearly 7 million views or something along those lines. Um, and then there was a bit of a radio silence from YouTube itself until they then took to Twitter and said, oh, the reason we've took so long is because we've been thinking about what we should do rather than making any kind of like immediate reaction to such a, a shocking video. Um, and then I think in response to it, they just sort of temporarily suspended him, um, and it was all a bit half-hearted. Yeah, and then they made, uh, they made kind of wider changes to the rules around like payment for videos especially, which we know has hit Logan Paul hard, but it's also hit other people as well. 
Yeah, so YouTube's made quite a lot of changes over the past sort of year or so. Um, there was something called the Adpocalypse a little while ago, which hit the big creators really hard. Um, and I think it was to do with a lot of advertisers pulling out um, because of the fact that there was quite a lot of controversial content being uploaded. Um, so that was the original change that was made. But then in regards to Logan Paul, um, YouTube made the decision to um, put more of like a bottom limit on their AdSense. So it was more to do with if you didn't have a certain number of subscribers and you weren't getting a certain amount of monthly views, you weren't entitled to make any AdSense. And you kind of have to look at that um, from two ways because in like the grand worldly scheme, that meant that the small channels in all the darkest corners of the world that are uploading really awful, violent, shocking content weren't able to gain anything from it because no one's subscribing to those channels. They just get the views. So that meant that they couldn't make any money. So on that bigger picture, it works well. But then when you focus in more on the actual sort of YouTube community that I'm a part of, it means that, say, Jenny in Sussex who wants to be a beauty blogger and has been trying for three years, uploading three times a week, then it's more of a kick in the teeth for her, really, because it means that her smaller YouTube channel has been targeted as well. So there's two different ways of looking at that, I guess. And it feels like maybe YouTube's reaction was was kind of not not an appropriate response to Logan Paul because obviously he was one of the biggest creators in the world, and so these new rules don't really affect him at all. It's it's protecting themselves against like you say the extremist content, but also maybe protecting their brands from having to deal with anyone that's, that's controversial. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was it would have been a really good opportunity for YouTube to kind of make an example of Logan Paul because he be kind of he kind of became this one representation of YouTube as a whole, which was really frustrating for all the other creators who don't really want to be associated with that kind of thing. Um, he became such an example of YouTube that it would have been a perfect chance for them to really use him as the opportunity to say, look, we won't stand for this, we won't accept this crack down on it, make an example of him, and kind of take some quite, like, maybe quite extreme um, actions on his channel, either take his channel down, completely demonetize it, stop promoting him. Any of those things would have been really good, but instead, he, I think he got like a temporary suspension on his advertising, um, which I think is now back in full force. I don't think he's lost subscribers from the, the experience. I think he's actually gained a huge amount of publicity because he was also then discussed by every major news outlet across the world. Not even just the, the actual story of the suicide forest, but also all the articles that are along the lines of, who is Logan Paul? All about the notorious blogger. And that kind of attention is only going to benefit his channel, if anything. So I think the whole thing was handled in a bizarre way, really. And so who do you think is... Do you think YouTube is responsible for that then? Because obviously there's, there's kind of four elements to like, the responsibility of content. It's the person that creates it, um, YouTube itself for hosting it, it's the brand that advertise it to support it, and then it's the audience for watching it. So who is, how does that kind of work? Um, I think if you look at the bigger picture, there's the four elements of that. Um, I think YouTube is probably the top of the umbrella of all of that um, because it has kind of become this, platform where content like that is celebrated and it's all about who can shout the loudest, who can have the craziest clickbait titles, who can like really push that shock factor across because that's what YouTube seems to be rewarding at the moment in terms of promoting the content, putting it on the trending page, getting it in the news and that kind of thing. So I think YouTube itself really needs to look at the, the creators that it's promoting and what it supports in terms of its content. Um, and then I think as you could then go down from that, the next step would be the creator because that's where it gets a lot more personal. And the thing about YouTube is that there's such blurred lines between the fact that you are this content creator that wants to reach as many people as possible, but there's also such a personal element to it. And you, like, people watch you because they think of you as a best friend and they like listening to you because you're a pal. So they want to be able to kind of trust you and, and that kind of thing. Um, so you have to remember that that relationship with your viewers is a genuine, a genuine connection as far as they're concerned anyway. Um, and you have to remember that you're responsible for what you're putting across to them. You have to take some accountability for that, I think. Um, in terms of the brand being responsible, I think it's, that's probably the next level down, but it is still very much up to them to make sure that they're doing the background research that they need to 
to make sure that the content creators that they're working with haven't got this controversial past that they've kind of buried in the sand. Um, I, like it's it discussed quite often in the in the Twitter YouTube community and that kind of thing, and amongst friends, that brands will often work with the YouTubers that are a little bit controversial or whatever, and that's not something that it's something that's quite difficult to watch because you build up yourself as a reputable brand, and then you see the big deals going to the YouTubers that are maybe getting success for the wrong reasons. And that can be quite frustrating for the rest of the community to have to sit back and watch. I think, um, and then in terms of the viewers. I think obviously you have to take accountability for it, but then if that video is presented to you on your home page and it's got a title that is really quite clickbaity, you, you can't help but want to click on it and give it that view. So I wouldn't necessarily blame the audience as much as maybe the other three options there. But then again, YouTube is what you make it in your own internet space is what you make it. So if you click on that video, then you are contributing to the culture of the clickbait videos and the shock videos. And with YouTube um, being an American organization particularly, um, there's often conversations about free speech. So when it comes to this sort of thing, their defense is often that it's free speech, which people seem to be confusing someone's right to free speech to um, the fact that YouTube thinks they have to host it. Is it sort of like having Donald Trump on Twitter, the fact that he breaches their violations all, you know, all the time, but they never kick him off because kicking him off would lose them ultimately traffic. Yeah, absolutely. I think, YouTube, as I mentioned before, those blurred lines kind of make you forget sometimes that YouTube is a business. At the end of the day, they are one of the world's biggest business, I imagine, like hugely, hugely profitable. And at the end of the day, their priority is to make as much money as possible. Like as much as you want to sugarcoat it and say, oh, it's, my subscription box is full of my best friends and I love watching them every day, the platform itself is a business. And if it works in their favor to have these really hugely controversial vloggers that, every, that gets everybody talking and everybody onto their website and watching their adverts, then that's what they're going to promote, I guess. But it's it's difficult to kind of like find the balance between business and integrity, I think, with something like this. And have you found, um, obviously you're working with brands on a regular basis, have you found that they're after controversial content? Because like you say, some of them do work with controversial posts. Are they, are they pushing you to do that or maybe going in the, the opposite direction? I think in terms of the videos that I do, I'm not really so much one of these kind of like daily shock factor vloggers. So I think maybe the businesses that work with that kind of content would still be looking for those really clicky headlines and titles and the thumbnails that make everyone go, ooh, like that looks interesting. Um, I think in, in terms of my area of YouTube, which is more kind of lifestyle based, I do like beauty, uh, relationships, like home life, that kind of thing. Um, I actually think they're erring more on the side of caution after everything that's happened recently. Um, I've done a couple of sponsorship videos recently where I've put forward ideas that sort of fit with my tone of channel. I'm quite sort of tongue in cheek and talk about a lot of things that 20 something girls would want to talk about. And the brands themselves have wanted to steer clear of certain topics that might be sort of a little bit controversial. Um, I pitched an idea recently that was to do with like the whole Me Too, um, like Hollywood stuff that's going on at the moment. And they wanted to steer well clear of that because I don't know, I guess it's a, a little bit too on the nose. Um, so I think some brands may be after the as many views as possible kind of angle, but others are t kind of taking it in the total opposite direction and saying, actually, we don't want to be tied up in any of the controversy that's going on at the moment. I think it's really interesting, the idea that you know, you're know you pitching to them saying, look, we can do this around this topic, and they're saying no. Like, do you ever... Have you ever attempted to just do political videos yourself? Not, not political, but like messages that are brands considered political yourself? Um, I am not like scared to talk about anything on my channel. If it's something that I feel affects my audience, which tends to be sort of like early 20s, mid 20s, females, mostly in the UK, if I feel like, it, like it's something that affects them or like an issue like feminism, for example, is something that I quite enjoy talking about on my channel because it gets discussion going. My audience are quite receptive to it. It's something that they're interested in. Um, so I'm not worried about talking about anything like that. But it's just maybe I would rather keep those kind of conversations away from my sponsored videos where it, it just falls more on my shoulders if anyone has an issue with it rather than implicating any brands or my management or that kind of thing who then would have to get involved who was a sponsored video. And with, with 
like those kind of messages you're keeping away from sponsors. Do you ever get spon sponsors or, or you know, collaborators who are looking at your other content and saying, actually, you're talking about this, and maybe that's not quite right? Or do they, like, do they ever put pressure on you and not talk about things personally? Or is that completely your, your choice? Um, I like to keep it my choice in general when it comes to an advert or a sponsorship. Uh, I like to have as much creative control as I can because I, I only really ever want to do business when it seems genuine. I wouldn't ever want to have an, av an advert that sticks out like a sore thumb on my channel. And I get quite a lot of comments which say that people appreciate that because a lot of YouTubers will just advertise anything for the sake of it. Whereas I will very much sit and think about does this actually fit genuinely on my channel? Um, and I, I think it's always really obvious as well if a brand approaches you, if they have actually watched your videos before, or whether they've just seen your 50,000 subscribers, 10,000 Twitter followers, 10,000 Instagram followers, and you've ticked a number of boxes that their boss has asked them to find. I always think that comes across really obvious, whether they know your tone, they know your sense of humor. I think as well, because mine's quite niche as well, it's quite like a self-deprecating kind of tone, really. So it's always quite obvious whether they've actually ever watched my videos before or not. So that's always a bit of a factor when it comes to that as well. So what advice would you give brands and PRs that are listening to approach you in the right way and to come up with good content collaborations? Um, ideally, as much creative control as possible. Um, I always like to receive an email that kind of shows that they have actually watched some of my content and they understand what I'm about and the kind of like vibe and message that I like to put across. I always like to know that that's something that they've acknowledged. Um, if they kind of approach me and say, this is what we're um, kind of like advertising or we're trying to sell or whatever, um, we'd really we'd be keen to hear some ideas from you of how that might fit into your channel. If you've got any ideas of how that could work for you, we'd be really open to hearing that. Um, and then I like to have a kind of like a little bit of a discussion or negotiation about how their idea and my idea could actually come together before they just fire over a brief and say, look, we're looking for this video which talks three minutes about this product within the first five minutes because that's so structured and kind of like strict for what you have to stick to. Um, and then obviously my management will also then step in and say, oh, how about we do this? That could work much better. Um, and it's just more of kind of like a discussion rather than just a straightforward, this is what we're looking for. Can you do this for us? So how does it work with how does it work with management? So you can feel free to name drop your management, but like how does it work with management and making decisions? Is it is it collaborative between you and them ultimately? Uh, yes, yeah, so my management is above the fray uh, for anyone who's interested. Um, and basically, I will I will usually receive the emails straight into my inbox. And then if it's something that I feel I'm interested in working on, if it's a brand name that I'd quite like to work with or a topic that I'm interested in, I will then forward it on to my manager um, who can then do the more kind of like admin style negotiations. Um, and then they'll usually give me a ring and say, this is what they're keen to advertise. Is that something you're interested in? Uh, this is the initial idea that they have, but they're open to your suggestions. How could this work on your channel? And because they understand what I like to do, and they know my channel and my audience really well, um, it's usually quite a collaborative thing. And if there's anything that they think is a little bit too risky or whatever, they'll knock me back in line and say, how about we do this instead or that kind of thing. So it's, it's like an interesting like creative discussion that we usually have. And we're seeing, um, obviously we spend quite a lot of time talking to different bloggers and vloggers and we're seeing a trend in, um, it used to be that brands would get in touch for like a one-off post or a one-off piece or they've got a new product, it's a launch and then that's it, it's kind of on your blog and, and then disappeared. Is it more a trend now towards like long-term collaborations, like working over a longer period of time? Yeah, I've actually had a couple recently that um, have turned out to be ongoing sponsorships rather than just like one-off adverts that appear every now and again. And I've had a couple of like repeat brands as well who've wanted to come back and work with me. Um, so I've recently just had a sponsorship that's for a whole year rather than just like a one-off um, campaign or whatever. And I think that shows like a really nice element of trust in that they trust the fact that you're going to continue to produce that great content for the next 12 months. Um, and I think it's nice for the audience as well to see that you actually believe in a product that much that you're willing to kind of promote it for that ongoing period rather than just think, oh, it's a quick check or whatever, that's fine, I'm a bit skinned this month. Um, so I think it's quite nice to have that like ongoing relationship with a brand. And obviously you don't have to give us any details specifically, but um, with, with like a year-long collaboration, like how does that work? Are they after like a certain number of videos? Are they after like up to you what you do? Is it, so how does that work on a, like a creative? 
Um, it's still like an ongoing thing, to be honest. We're in touch all the time with like potential ideas of what could be coming up. Um, but I've just finished my first campaign for them. So it was kind of like a brief per campaign kind of thing that we've been doing. Um, so the first one was a sponsored video, a couple of matching Instagrams, and a couple of Instagram stories. And that was kind of like the first set box off kind of thing. And it just... It seems to be the idea that they'll just be, they'll pop along up and like as and when it kind of suits the, the brand, I think. That makes perfect sense. And this is going to be um, an awful segue, but um, do you ever approach brands yourself um, to want to work with them or do you, do you just let them approach you? Yeah, I've approached a couple. Um, it always seems to be the way that I'll kind of sit down one day and think, right, this, this is the week that I'm going to approach some brands and then I'll get uh, 100 emails in my inbox or something. It's just sort of typical. Um, but if there's like certain brands that I feel would really work well with my channel, um, work well with my kind of like tone of voice and that kind of thing, I've definitely sent them emails in the past. Uh, there's a couple that have turned into work previously. But I think even if it doesn't turn into work, it's nice to start that connection and introduce yourself and say, even if you've got nothing at the moment that would work, Work, how about we keep in touch and see what comes up in the future? Actually, leads me very nicely on to um, our next topic. So, when it when it goes wrong, so um, obviously this situation, um, uh, is, I'm not going to link this or anything because obviously they both had quite a lot of attention from this. But um, it was a vlogger who asked to stay in a hotel, and he's notorious for being controversial and calling people out. And so that happened, and there was a whole like. Lava, <laughs> good word. Um, but just like, what's your view on this situation? And if you haven't read this, this is um, a direct screenshot from the Vulia blog, so you can check it out there. Um, I feel really sorry for the girl who was involved in this. I think she had such bad luck with it. But then I also think that both sides were a little bit in the wrong. So I think the guy who runs the hotel is quite well known for being not the most pleasant person to deal with, I think, when it comes to um, like influencers and bloggers and that kind of thing. Um, I know in the past that he's caused a couple of different controversies just to kind of get that viral content kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure whether it's genuine or not, but it's worked well for him in the past, I think. He's definitely like got the Facebook likes from it. Um, so I think he is definitely wrong in the way that he handled it. Um, at the end of the day, she's running a business. She's looking out for herself. She wants to get as much as she can from her influence and this amazing platform that she's built and why shouldn't she when she's put all the work in um, and I also think that if you're not involved in the blogging community and like the blogging lifestyle and it's not something that you really understand or know about it can be a really confusing industry um, I know I get asked on a regular basis by my mum when are you going to get a proper job I think it's that kind of vibe of these people aren't really doing a proper job for a living they're just kind of getting all the they're out for all the freebies they can get um, and I think if you're not involved in it properly that is a really easy mentality to have about it so I get why someone would react like that um, but I also think that her approach to it wasn't necessarily great I, I saw the email that she sent out and it was very polite and it was friendly um, but I think if she was really pitching that as a business idea rather than just oh is there any chance I can get a free weekend it should have been a little bit more structured and I don't think she really sort of mentioned what she could provide for them what in terms of like um, the traffic that she could get to their website or she didn't really give any specific examples of the achievements that she'd done in the past or anything like that I think it was just a little bit rushed um, and I think it could have just been done a little bit better um, but I'm I'm fully team blogger on that one because I think it was I think it was really embarrassing for her and I don't think anyone should really be criticized for trying to make a living and run, run their business and it is just a part of blogging that you you have experiences like that and you work alongside people for mutual benefit so I was definitely team blogger I think we're all team blogger here um, if any listeners aren't team blogger feel free to let us know on Twitter um, but the idea that you know, this kind of happened because people, I think it was the backlash afterwards, it was people that were siding with him, the hotel owner, to say, actually, yeah, she's a, a freeloader or she's, you know, just taking the mickey. But it's the idea that um, as an industry, it's, it's not really developed, it doesn't really have like a formal structure because people are just start at home, you can make videos and content, it's very easy to access it. So you're also a freelance, a freelance journalist, you write for big publications, so it's different in that respect because your content is being managed by someone else and it's an established career path, right? 
Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's a lot um, in common between the two, especially because the platforms that I write for tend to be of a similar tone to the kind of YouTube videos that I like to watch. They're quite sort of like, they're young platforms, they're informal, they're kind of entertainment news, that kind of thing. So there is kind of like a common link between the two, but in terms of delivering content between the two, it is very different because with the journalism, I'm working for a much bigger umbrella brand really and whatever I put onto that platform then has to go through an editor who has to approve it all. There'll be a number of CEOs or keeping an eye on the website as well um, to make sure that everything that represents their brand is all in order. Um, whereas YouTube is much more of a it's your face on the line kind of thing. It's up to you to make your own decisions um, and it's a much more kind of straight one-to-one -one experience really rather than the journalism. Yeah, and the amount of rules that, that you know you have as a blogger is, is limited. And you know we have um, we have the the cap code from the ASA, which is about um, advertising and disclosure. Um, and on the left here, we've got um, a flowchart from the Internet Advertising Bureau, which is um, shows like what digital advertisers need to do to work with bloggers. So uh, we've got a question here from Sarah, which is, what is your opinion on brands that have ambassadors? who seem to promote their products in a subtle and ongoing way, but without stating that a certain video or post is an ad. So this kind of idea that you can be an ambassador rather than you're advertising it, it's subtle but not clear maybe? Yeah, I think this is a, ma a real kind of massive issue with the whole like influencer lifestyle at the moment. I think it's such a new thing. Um, it feels like it's been around forever, but it's such a new thing that I think the guidelines are still very up in the air and there's a lot of loopholes in the system that you can get through if you really want to. I think that whole ambassador thing is just awful. Every time I see it, it really grinds my gears because it's so strict the fact you have to have hashtag ad on there and apparently it can really affect like if you use hashtag ad in your Instagram post it can affect the algorithm and it might not push your post as much because it wants to encourage you to pay to push the push the post instead um, so there's just so many kind of problems with it all and I think it really needs to be a lot more defined um, but I do think more so than the bloggers and the youtubers that are doing this whole ambassador thing it's actually more the celebrities that tend to do that and I feel like they tend to get away with a lot more kind of like vague advertising advertising than bloggers do because they don't have quite such a, a dedicated audience as the YouTubers do. I feel like YouTubers get a lot more backlash if they don't declare something than a celebrity does. So like because a celebrity is, is based on, for whatever reason, they're famous and then they're also advertising on the side, whereas for a YouTuber or a blogger, that's their career. So you know, they have to make it very clear what they're doing or people think that they're, they're being sneaky. So do you think there needs to be more regulation in blogging and vlogging? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's more regulation because I think the regulation is there, but it's just so confusing. I really wish there was, I know there is websites that you can go to to kind of like check what the guidelines are and that kind of thing, but they are still so confusing when you go and visit them and you try and figure them out all by yourself. Um, so I, I really wish there was a much more kind of clear, structured, step-by-step -step following that you could go to that would literally spell it out for you because it's just so confusing. It is, there's just so many blurred lines in there that it's, it is really difficult to figure it out sometimes. Um, we are approaching the end of the webinar, and I know everyone has probably got places to be, but we have some questions coming in. Um, I have a question about, um, about the Dublin Hotel thing, actually. Um, so this person has asked, what was the benefit of, of El Darby making a video afterwards? Um, because... He tried, he, when he posted the fact he received it, he badly hid her YouTube. So she was findable, but she then came out with a video to apologize and to say this. The question uh, is from Sarah who says, um, was this a benefit to herself on a business level or was it more about standing up for the blogging community? Um, I think the way he hid her name wasn't particularly done very well and I think in the comments section of the post someone had then outed her full name and I think that in itself because the post got so much attention I think that one comment was enough to, for her to receive the backlash um, so I think she probably took the conscious decision to make the announcement herself a to cover her own back and avoid all the awkwardness of it just being kind of like mentioned all around her and B I think if something like that does happen to you and you haven't really done anything wrong then you might as well try and turn it around and make it work to the best of your advantage. I mean, Logan Paul did it in a, in a terrible way, but I feel like Elle did it in quite a good way because 
she did do it in terms of the community as a whole kind of thing and spoke up for the fact that it is just a part of blogging and it's a new industry that a lot of people don't understand. I think she handled it all quite well, to be honest, and I think she gained a lot of subscribers from it, so who's the real winner? Yeah, and I think anything that shines a light on blogging, because as you say, it's an unknown industry, so anything that shines a light on it is ultimately good for blogging. Um, we have a question here from uh, Kelly. Are you ever tempted to create controversial content in order to boost your audience? Yeah, I have, I've actually done a video about this before because sometimes it, it literally feels like if you're just on YouTube to create quiet, cozy, chatty, best friend style content, the platform is not there to help you. Um, and it can really feel sometimes like, oh, if I just film a video of myself talking about some shocking thing that's happened to me, I'll get loads of views from that and suddenly my subscriber count will go up, so maybe I should just do that. And it is something that does cross your mind, but I guess you just, it's just a test of your own integrity, really. And I think as well, when you've built up a, a following, whether it's big or small, they know what to expect from you and they know whether a video is coming from a genuine place or whether you've done it for a little bit of attention. So I think if anybody is tempted, at, ever is tempted by that, it will come back and bite you if you do kind of steer away from your usual kind of content because people follow you for a reason. They obviously like the stuff that you usually create. So if you steer away from that, I think it will work to your disadvantage in the long run. Excellent. I think we've got time just for one quick question. Uh, it's from Paul. It's, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Is it always through your management? Um, not necessarily. I'm quite happy to be approached personally, and it's always nice to speak directly to um, PRs or companies or brands. I like to kind of meet them face to face as well and arrange to like go for a drink or a coffee or food or whatever. It's nice to have that like face to face connection rather than just a faceless email every now and again. Um, but then obviously, if it is more to do with like a proper sponsorship or whatever, that would then go through my management. So I'm happy either way. Twitter is always a good a good outreach as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, thank you to everyone listening. Um, we look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. Thank you very much. Goodbye.